Hello and welcome to Basic Medical Sciences. If this is your first time here, please make sure you subscribe so that you won't miss any of our latest videos. Today we are talking about the influenza viruses. Influenza viruses belong to orthomyxoverid family, so they are orthomyxoviruses. They are negative sense single-stranded RNA viruses. Uh, and as I said in our introduction to RNA videos, I said uh, positive sense single-stranded RNA viruses will be represented by the sun and negative sense single-stranded RNA viruses will be represented by the moon. So here is the moon. These negative sense single-stranded RNA viruses should be first converted to positive sense RNA viruses. In our cells, we don't have the enzyme which do this conversion. So they bring their own enzyme called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Right. So this is uh, specifically a viral enzyme. Right. These viruses have an envelope. And I want you to remember that all negative sense RNA viruses, they have an envelope. These viruses, they have a helical capsid. And again, you need to remember this. All negative sense RNA viruses, they have a helical capsid. In general, RNA viruses replicate in the cytoplasm of the host cell. But we have two exceptions. The retroviruses and the orthomix of viruses. These two, they replicate in the nucleus of the host cell. Here is your nucleus. Influenza viruses are segmented, right? So I want to help you remember like all the segmented viruses using a simple mnemonic. And it goes like this. Boarding flight 382 in 10 to 12 minutes. Boarding flight 382 in 10 to 12 minutes, right? So you can use uh, the first part, BO, BO, right? B for banya viruses. So the banya viruses have three segments. Orthomix of viruses, that's influenza, what we're discussing right now. They have eight segments. Arena viruses have two segments. And Rio viruses have 10 to 12 segments. Boarding flight 382 in 10 to 12 minutes. Now let's talk about the classification of influenza viruses. All right. So based on antigenic nature of the ribonuclear protein, that's the internal antigen, there is influenza A, influenza B, and influenza C. All right. Influenza A is uh, responsible for the pandemics. Influenza B, responsible for epidemics. And influenza C is responsible for sporadic infections. Now, let's talk about the envelope glycoproteins of the influenza viruses. All right. So, they have uh, this this spike glycoproteins, right? So this one is specifically called hemagglutinins, right? So uh, you have uh, four important ones, H1, H2, H3, and H5, right? Uh, this spanner and screwdrive, they represent another glycoprotein also known as neuraminides, right? So here we have uh, uh, three important flavors, N1, N2, and N7. Right, so uh, this leads us to our next topic, antigenic variation. So you need to know that uh, there is antigenic shift and antigenic drift. Right, so I'm going to help you uh, like to remember uh, these two because they are very important. First, antigenic shift. Right, so this happens like when one cell is infected by two different segmented viruses, right? For example, swine influenza and human influenza, right? These two, let's say they infect one cell. 
what will happen is there will be a RNA segment reassortment, right? After this reassortment, uh, we will end up having a new strain, right? So that new strain will be uh, completely different from the previous one, right? So this kind of uh, mutation is responsible for the pandemics. Now let's talk about antigenic drift, right? Antigenic drift, this is simply like a random mutation in hemagglutinin or neuraminidase. It's actually, uh, they are point mutations, so the changes are minor. So antigenic drift is responsible for epidemics, right? How do you remember this? Here is a simple mnemonic for you. Sudden shift is more deadly than gradual drift. Sudden shift is more deadly. So this one is a pandemic. Sudden shift is more deadly. It's a pandemic. And gradual drift is an epidemic. All right? As simple as that. So now let's talk about the pathogenesis of influenza. All right? Oh, sorry, guys. I did not tell you the transmission of influenza. Right, so it's primarily transmitted through uh, respiratory droplets, specifically coughing and sneezing, right? So the influenza viruses bind to the respiratory tract epithelium, right? And using the viral hemagglutinin, uh, they bind to sialic acid residues, right? So these residues are, co are actually neuraminic acid derivatives, right and they are found on the cell membrane right uh, of the host so this will allow a fusion of the virus and the cell membrane of the host leading to entrance of the virus into the host cell the virus will then replicate in the nucleus of the cell as i said and then after synthesizing new viruses then these viral particles uh, they will move out to the cell membrane and then uh, they will form buds, right? So by process of budding to, uh, in order to, to get outside of the host cell. But they will need uh, neuraminidase, right? Neuraminidase uh, will cleave the neuraminic acid so that the virions will exit the host cell. And then from there, uh, so this is representing uh, the neuraminidis from there the host cell will die and from cell death uh, it will release uh, triggers of immune response now let's talk about the clinical features uh, of influenza right in 75 percent of the cases is actually mild or asymptomatic right the influenza present with very characteristic features, so they are called flu-like symptoms, right? And the incubation period is a uh, few hours to several days, and it's characterized by sudden onset fever with chills, headache, arthralgia, myalgia, fatigue, and malaise, right? So some patients, uh, may, they often develop acute bronchitis uh, with a cough, which is usually dry, but sometimes they can produce small amounts of clear or blood-tinged sputum. And uh, especially among women and older patients, uh, hypotension and bradycardia are common. Right. Uh, then there is one more thing you need to remember on uh, clinical features. Uh, patients are at risk of uh, super infection, mostly by staph aureus, strep pneumo, and H flu. Right? You need to remember this super infection. Now let's talk about diagnosis of the in of influenza. Now let's talk about diagnosis of influenza, right? So we can use three methods, blood tests, rapid antigen test, and serological testing, right? Uh, blood test first. 
uh, here what we get is like normally we will um, detect like uh, inflammatory markers for example c-reactive protein sometimes it will be normal or slightly uh, elevated and also there might be relative lymphocytosis right Okay, moving to rapid antigen test, right? This one, actually, uh, the influenza A or B antigen uh, are detected uh, via nasal or pharyngeal swabs. So these are the samples which we take. And this test is actually like, it is high specificity and limited sensitivity. And the a method we can use here is immunofluorescence all right and our last on serological testing all right serological testing here uh, is used mainly for diagnosis after an infection is resolved right uh, so it doesn't work like if for example like two days after infection it doesn't work there because it will give you a negative result Infection is likely if the serum antibody titers increases uh, by four within two weeks after acute illness. And the methods we can use here are complement fixation, hemagglutination inhibition tests. Now let's talk about the vaccines of influenza. Right. Firstly, uh, there is something called a formulated vaccine, right? Also known as a uh, flu shot, right? So it contains viral strains which are most likely to appear during the uh, flu season, right? And this is due to a rapid antigenic change, right? But the most frequently used vaccine is actually called or what a cured viral vaccine, right? Uh, and there is another one, which is live attenuated vaccine, right? And it contains temperature sensitive mutants that replicates in the nose, but not in the lungs, right? They replicate in the nose, but not in the lungs. And they are administered intranasally. Now let's conclude by talking about uh, treatment of influenza, right? So firstly, we can do supportive treatment like management of fever and pain and also rehydration, right? Uh, but we can use uh, like neuraminidase inhibitors. And if you remember, neuraminidase is responsible for cleaving the sialic uh, acid, right? So this treatment uh, should be initiated as soon as possible, like within first 48 hours if we suspect that this person might have influenza we need to uh to give uh neuraminidase inhibitors like as early as possible to uh, avoid viremia right so this neuraminidase inhibitors okay so i represented it like a gun like this they target the neuraminidase in this one Right, and the examples we have, um, okay, here I have three. I have inhalative zanamivir. Inhalative zanamivir. Inhalative zanamivir. Oral oseltamivir. And IV peramivir. Some time back, uh, there is a drug called amantadine, right? Oh, so it was used for treatment of influenza A, right? But it's no longer used uh, nowadays because what happened is like uh, around 2008 and 2009 flu, uh, the CDC, that's in America, right? They found that 100% of seasonal H3N2 and 2009 pandemic viruses were resistant to amantadine. Right, so this drug is now used for treatment of Parkinson's disease because of its antagonism to NMDA receptors. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please make sure you subscribe so that you won't miss any of our latest videos because we will be uploading videos almost each and every day. Until next time. Head bowed.